My next guest is the reigning NBA MVP and six-time All-Star who's currently unleashing some of the most potent basketball of his career. A bloke has just reeled off an astonishing 21 straight 30-point games for his Philadelphia 76ers, including the jaw-dropping, earth-stopping January the 22nd, 70-point night that broke Wilt Chamberlain's 57-year-old franchise record, making him the kind of unstoppable force of nature that Jim Cantore usually covers. My guest, also a lifelong madly passionate football fan, a lover of both Real Madrid and Arsenal Football Club. At seven feet tall and 280 pounds, he's a bloke who makes towering goalkeeper Thibaut Courtois look like, well, Spud Webb. It's great to welcome Joel Embiid. What's up, boys? How you doing? Oh, I'm amazing because I'm with you, you beautiful, incredible human being. We are talking just two days after your 70-point game against San Antonio, transcendent night, just the ninth player in the history of the NBA to drop 70 in a single game. Few players, Joel, have scored that much on the Spurs other than you and Mo Salah. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> I guess more more has a history of uh, bidding up on the Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does, and so do you in your own way. Your stat line: seventy points, eighteen rebounds, five assists. Basketball Reference database was smoking like Maurizio Sarri at a Marlboro outlet. No player has hit those numbers in one game, let alone in just 37 minutes. I do need to know, how did it feel inside? Did it feel like cartoon physics, like the basket was bending to meet the ball? Or did you feel like it was almost out of body? You know what? I'll be honest, the funny thing is after the game... I was actually mad at myself because I thought I could have been better. Like, I thought I left so many points on the board. You know, I missed so many easy ones. To be honest, I wasn't pushing enough because I think if I was really trying to push for it, you know, I could have played more minutes. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good thing, but I was also mad at myself for, you know, leaving up, what? you know, so many easy ones. I did rem- you remind me, I, when I heard about it, I tuned in for the end. It reminded me of a young Erling Haaland who scored nine goals in one game for Norway under-20s against, I think, Honduras in the World Cup. And he left the field not celebrating. He was furious that he'd missed the chance in the dying seconds. It's that same pure scoring mentality. Yeah, I mean, you know, you never want to be satisfied because you always got to find you know, that edge uh, that can, you know, take you to another level. Uh, Obviously, it was an amazing night. I'm not saying that it wasn't. It was great. Um, But I also felt like, you know, I could have been a little bit better. I love you. And and looking for that edge as a long-time Arsenal fan, was it knowing that you were playing against a team with spurs in the name that set you off? (laughs) I mean, you could say that, you know, being a gunner, that was pretty easy to get that edge and be like, well, I'm playing against my rival, so I got to go off and make sure that, you know, I kill him. <laughs> I'm just glad there's no team in the NBA called Everton, Joel. But the journey to the NBA has been a remarkable one to witness, an improbable one in a way that you've said can seem more like a movie script than a real-life story. You grew up in Yaoundé, the capital city of Cameroon, West Central Africa, a nation where football is the true number one sport, where asking a kid to play anything else is like asking if Pepsi is okay, largely because of the national team, those indomitable Lions. And you were a kid when Cameroon went back-to-back African Cup of Nations tournaments in 2000 and 2002. Teams of legendary striker Samuel Eto'o, immovable defender Rigobert Song, now the national team's manager. What do you remember about those matches in your youth and that footballing passion that really just resounds across that nation? Man, it was the best. Uh, I don't know if it's still the same as it used to be, but I remember growing up, Every game was just, it didn't matter if it was like a friendly game or a big game or whatever. You could tell that everybody was just tuned in to their TVs, just paying attention. And the funny thing is when, you know, Cameroon would score, everybody would just scream, go outside, you know, 
start acting crazy. You could you could tell the whole nation was just screaming after every goal. Like that, those used to be, you know, fun times. And then obviously, like you mentioned, Ethel uh, made he made his dream. You know, growing up, obviously, I played. You know, football. I don't like to call it soccer, although they do it in America, but it's real football. But, you know, made his dream. You know, that was my first love. And to be honest, I love football more than basketball, so I wish I was a football player. I want to talk about your love of football because it is incredibly special, but I do need to do a quick Africa Cup of Nations update. It's raging at the moment. Cameroon slipped into the round of 16. We are lucky. After a truly bonkers win against the Gambia, wild 3-2 comeback. On Tuesday, the manager, Rigobert Song, decided to bench his starting goalkeeper, Manchester United's Andre Onana. How are you feeling, Joel? Can this Cameroon side, this indomitable Lions, win it all? I mean, the same thing happened the last time uh, we won the African Cup. So I, w- I would imagine that we got a pretty good chance. But the way it was looking until, you know, we made, you know, that comeback... Uh, I mean, I thought I thought we were done for a second, especially when they scored that goal and it was 2-1 hours out here. Like, I had a group chat with, you know, my Camonian friends and we were just going off. We were like, yeah, it's, it's over. And the next thing you know, we get our own goal, you know, 2-2, and then we get the the winner at the end. I think, you know, anything, anything is possible, especially, you know, when you're aligned. So, you know, the line, we like, we, are, we have a saying. The line is never dead. You know, anything is possible. You always got to pay attention because the moment you don't pay attention, he's going to pounce and he's going to kill you. The lion is never dead. I adore that. I mean, this is a footballing aphorism that you have lived. And I want to talk about you as a footballer, Joel. I know your parents wanted your focus to be on schoolwork, not football. But you were told the story about how you used to come home, scatter your homework on the table then run right outside to play in the football field by your house before the kid playing goalkeeper would tell you that he could hear your mum's car coming, at which you'd sprint home, pretend like you'd been up to your eyebrows in your science homework or whatever. Serious question, in your entire career, Joel, have you ever faced a coach that was more intimidating than your own mother? Never, never. Think about this. If you know the sound of a car that's, you know, so far away, that's how you know, you know, that's very scary. And, you know, it got to the point where, like, I'm telling you, like, I used to jump over the barrier just to go play, you know, football because obviously that was the passion. I wanted to be a football player. And, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, like, we, you know, everybody knew. Like, my mom, she was nothing to play with. Like, I got to be home, and we basically had lookouts, like, you know, like whenever someone saw, you know, made a sign, Joel's mom, I got to run home, and think about it, at the time, like, I was playing with no shoes, you know, I'm all dirty, so you basically got, what, a minute or two from the moment that she gets to the house, park the car, gets inside the house, to make sure that you're clean and act like you were actually studying or doing your homework, so, but... You know, I ended up mastering it, and uh, I got in trouble a few times, but it, it, it was a fun experience. I bet you were kidding no one in reality, but what kind of a player were you? Take us there. What kind of skills did eight-year-old Joel have on the football field? It's funny. I mean, I've always, you know, obviously following Eto, you know, footsteps. I always wanted to be a striker, but I was just way too big. And, you know, I kind of found myself, you know, in the midfield because I just felt like I, I like to control, like I like to be maestro, just, you know, make the passes and just control the whole game. I was more like, kind of like a yaya toure, where just using your body, you know, just making the right passes, obviously being bigger than everybody else. I was more physical and, you know, people were actually scared of me because I would just make some move and act like I'm going, you know, I don't know, kick you in the foot and everybody will be scared. So I was kind of like the the bully, but like a yaya two-way, you know, physical, presence, big, tall. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I wish I had more talent to be professional, but I guess I didn't. Yeah, yeah, Torre told us that he used to control games using only his buttocks. They were that strong and sizable, and I loved him all the more for that. But was pursuing football ever a real possibility for you? Is there a parallel universe 
where Joel Embiid is every defender's nightmare, where you're the one player who makes Virgil van Dijk wake up in a cold sweat? I mean, if Joel was a couple of feet shorter, yeah. <laughs> a seven feet? I don't think so. Even in goalkeeper, I don't think I'd be good in, you know, a seven feet. But yeah, alternate universe where Joel is better than Messi, Ronaldo, yeah, for sure. I would have been, oof. I want to live in that alternate universe. What if our best? Oh, athletes play football, America. You know, Joel, we had Steve Kerr on this show a couple of times, and he said he would love it if every teen basketball player mastered football because he thinks it gives you that game, our game, a better sense of space, a better mastery of passing. Do you feel any part of your basketball game has been informed by your football skills, your fundamental football skills? I started playing basketball at 16. Uh, and, you know, from there, Akeem was one of the, you know, the guys that I, I looked up to. And, you know, Kobe was the other one. But Akeem, you, if you look at his story, before basketball, he started, I think, at 15. And before that, he was a, you know, a football player. And he always said that, you know, his footwork actually came from, you know, playing football. And then... When you think about my story and the way I started, you know, at 16, I would have never thought I'd be sitting here because you start at 16. Everybody is so advanced. They'd be playing their whole career. And there's no way I would have thought I would have been, you know, sitting here. But I think you can kind of see that football had a lot to do with how much I developed. Like, where does the footwork and and I coordination and I think you know football you know play the huge role in you know me becoming what I am now it's incredible that story that you did not start playing pick up a basketball till you were 16 you're like the Cameroonian Matt Turner and everything that's happened to you since especially in that magnificent city of Philadelphia has been so well documented after the Sixers grabbed you with the third pick in the 2014 NBA draft but Joel, what everyone quickly learns when they follow you on social media for more than just 15 minutes is that you are mad passionate about football. You're a longtime Real Madrid supporter. You've been among those who've been wowed by the skills, the composure, the already iconic sellies of Jude Bellingham, the 20 year old who's thriving. Uh, in Madrid, 18 goals in just 26 appearances, all competitions. And I'm fascinated to hear world-class athletes talk about other world-class athletes. When you watch Jude Bellingham play so magnificently, what impresses you about his game? Is there anything you can build on? Or does he just look like the complete composed player at such a young age already? Man, it's hard to say. He's so good. And, you know, I I was already watching him before he got to Madrid when he was at Dortmund. Uh, And I never really thought he was, you know, that good of a scorer. But it's just his instinct. Like, he's always in the right space. Like, he's kind of like a... Like an honor, like Ronaldo. Like, always in the right space. Always at, you know, the right moment. He just... Like, it's hard to kind of explain because, like... I'm still, I'm still like just watching every Madrid game. I'm still trying to figure out why he's so good and how he's scoring all these goals. Like he's not, he's not a striker. For a long time, I thought he was just a midfielder. Like he was just, you know, whatever, a ten or whatever. But you know, this year, especially with the way Madrid is playing, most of the time he's the false nine, and you know, he's just coming and. I think I think everything goes back to his instinct. He's just always in the right spot, uh, extremely smart. The best players in your sport and in football make it look as if the ball comes to them. And watching him do that at such a young age has been yeah. just humanly transcendent. Yeah. But we do need to acknowledge this. You're also an Arsenal supporter. And you previously talked about how you connected to the club because of their history of signing iconic French players, Thierry Henry... Robert Perez, Olivier Giroud, that Trey Bellom, unshakable young centre-back in the modern team, William Saliba. Joel, there'll be a lot of NBA fans who know nothing about football watching this. So can you just take one moment and tell them what Arsenal stands for to you as a club and what they, future Arsenal fans, because of you in their lifetime, have in store if they follow your lead and become gunners? I mean, the Invincible, the team that, you know, 
they, they accomplished everything. Obviously, Arsene Wenger was great. And, you know, one of my favorite players, Terry Henry. And I know him uh, quite a bit, too. So, and like you said, uh, he started with, I've always followed, you know, French uh, football and French sport in general, and they ha always had a history of signing, you know, French players, Robert Pierce, um, you know, Thierry Henry, Bakar Sanya at one point. Um, so there's a few of them, but uh, it's been a long time. Finally, they have a shot at winning the league, but for some reason, I, I, I think, you know, you can't bet against Man City. Man City, although Liverpool, they're doing pretty good this year. But I hope the Gunners can, you know, they can figure it out because this is their best chance. Everton Football Club coming, Joel. They are coming. Watch them. But let's talk about last season because Arsenal had an eight-point lead over Manchester City. I'm bringing up bad memories. City then reeled off 11 straight wins to pull ahead, collect their third straight Premier League title because thinking they're ever out of the title race is like a Halloween film extra, thinking that Michael Myers is really gone. <laughs> How did you experience that season? Looking back, do you think about the joy you had watching Arsenal exceed expectations to thrive as a collective? You know, your WhatsApp messages with your fellow Arsenal fans, or did you just feel a bitter sting of disappointment slipping away down the stretch? I mean, it's hard to say because obviously coming into the season, they were not expected to be in that situation. And then over, you know, each game and each game, you start saying like, oh, there's actually a chance. Like, we can actually win the league. But then again, in the back of my mind, like, you know, there's been so much disappointment that I was always like, like even 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 me tweeting about you know the gunners and stuff. Like I kind of stopped because I was I don't want to jinx it. Like they were on the wall for so long that I was like, I'm not even gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna mention the Arsenal. I'm not gonna mention the gunners because I'm not. I don't want to be the reason why you know they lose and you know all of a sudden, Man City just like always they find a way. They get hot. And you know they win the league. It was it was painful, but then again, you know, the way you look at it is like the last couple of years have, have been so tough that you know you finally at the point where you got a chance to compete in the Champions League, which hasn't happened in a long time. And you know you finish second in the league against a great Man City team. I never like to take the you know, the good and bad situations. But, you know, in that situation, I was like, you know, at least it's better than what it used to be. You're a bigger man than I am, Joel, in every single way, clearly. But, you know, talking about Arsenal, while you've been with the Sixers, the team picked up that, that, that motif about trust the process. Yeah. And the process even became your nickname. You've watched this Arsenal team develop the past several seasons from the lows of back-to-back eighth-place finishes, six long years without an appearance in the Champions League. Something is building there. As a fan, do you trust the Arsenal process? Do you believe in what Mikel Ortes is building with this joyful set of young players? Oh, yeah, of course I do. You know, there's still so much to do. Last year, there was no expectations. And then this year, especially with how much they spent, um, you know, there was a lot of, there's a lot of expectations to go out and try to win uh, the league. But there's a reason why the Premier League is so hard and there's a reason why that's the best league in the world. Like, it's not going to be easy. Every game is going to be a challenge. And, you know, you got to have a deep team. You got to have some luck too. Everybody got to stay healthy. But I do trust the process. You always got to trust the process, uh, you know. And yeah, I'm sure at some point there's going to be some good ending to it. You've had a bright start this season. Second straight top of the table at Christmas Trophy in the bag. Then a stumble late December. Back-to-back -back losses against West Ham and Fulham. Joel, why is Arsenal missing? What, what do they need to win the Premier League this season? Um, kidnap Kylian Mbappe. <laughs> hey man, I yeah, I I can try to convince him, but then again, you know, I think you know you you know Madrid is up there, but I think yeah, kidnap Kylian Mbappe. That's the that's the way. <laughs> Get it done, Stan Kroenke. Get it done. I'm kidding. I think 
I think health is a big key. I think, you know, Gabriel uh, is a big part of, you know, what they do. Uh, I like Martinelli a lot. Uh, he's been great. And then obviously Saka has to be more productive. I, I, I still want him to score more goals than he does. Uh, and then in the midfield, I think, you know, what's missing? Obviously, Declan Rice has been great. Uh, but I think, you know, Partey is a big part of it. He's finally back and he's healthy. And I think he's going to help a lot. Odegaard is amazing. I'm surprised Madrid let him go. Odegaard is amazing. What do you see when you watch Odegaard as an elite NBA player? When you watch Odegaard, what do you see? He kind of plays like me if I was, you know, if I was his size. You know, he's just smooth. You know, he makes the right passes. He sees the field well before everybody even, you know, see the passes that he makes. Like, he just sees everything, you know, before everybody else. So, I mean, he's, he's amazing. He's an amazing talent. Give us your most optimistic case for Arsenal, Joel. I'll say top, top three. But I think in any sport, really, like, you got to have a little bit of luck. And I think they just haven't been healthy enough. And, you know, that's the thing. You got to stay healthy. But, you know, it's hard. Liverpool, it's, they seem to be back to, the, to what they were, uh, what, two, three years ago. Man City is always going to be there. Man United sucks. <laughs> Everton sucks. <laughs> Joel! We were doing so well. I want to have that. Everton. We're going to win League One in a couple of years' time. Let me tell you. The world does need to know this. If Real Madrid and Arsenal face each other in the Champions League quarterfinals, a blockbuster Jude Bellingham against Starboy Saka, who is Joel Embiid pulling for? Real Madrid. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like... The reason why Real Madrid is like my favorite, favorite team is obviously you got the Galatico years. Uh, Zidane is my favorite player of all time. King Bold. Yeah, I've always been in love with the history and what they've accomplished. Uh, and, you know, it's just, there's something about, you know, you know, the jersey, the white, and it's just Santiago Bernabe. Like, it's just something different about that like he's he makes you so passionate it's the mystique is what you're talking about is the the mystique the luster the heritage so like growing up it was always about you know real madrid and then as you go through it and the premier league is the best league in the uh in the world by far so i was like well if i'm following and you know obviously i'm it's not like i'm born in madrid where i'm like oh i can only have one team I'm like, well, I'm not born over there. That's my favorite team. But, you know, if I'm going to follow the Premier League, I got to have one team. And then that's how I fell in love with Arsene Wenger and Thierry Henry and what they were able to accomplish. And that's how I started supporting Arsenal. But I'm a Madrista, you know. I love you. I love you. Joel Embiid has got a lot of love to put out of the world, a big heart when he's watching football. But whether you're watching Real Madrid or Arsenal or like this weekend's riveting Everton-Luton matchup, what role does watching football play for you? Is it a stress reliever, a diversion? Is it an emotional thrill? Or is it just now part of your baked-in weekend routine? I watch football because I love it and I grew up watching it and I grew up loving it. But I think I also love football because I, it's a dream that I was never able to accomplish. I'm like, I want to feel what it's like. I want to be part of it. Like, I know a lot of, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, football players. But, like, I'm like, I'd rather be a football player than a basketball player. That's how much I love football. (laughs) Why? Football to me is like there's nothing close to it. Bigger sport in the world and there's nothing close to it. But I like the concept of, you know, the team. Like in basketball, like if you have, you know, two good players, you can win any game, really. But in football, like, you know, the team has to be together. The They have to follow the same concept. They have to follow the, whatever, the coach's instruction because the moment you don't, that you're not going to win. One mistake, it doesn't matter how good, you, how good you are offensively. If the defense is not pretty good, you're not going to win anything. By the way, you love everything about it. One of my favourite tweets of yours ever, Joel. You tweeted, Peter Drury, you are a treasure, sir. He's the best. I love him. 
I mean, I, I wish I wish I could take him away from football and have him do basketball games. I wish I can meet I can meet him one of these days and just ask him like, how does he come up with some of the phrases that he uses? I'm like, dude, like, dude, he's so smart. I'm like, where does that come from? Like, he's and the way he talks and the way he's like, he's so elegant. He's like, dang, like, dang, like, dude, like, you're so cool. <laughs> Well, you'll be so happy to hear this. I'm going to make that happen. By the way, Peter Drury doing basketball, he would emotionally explode. Just that end-to-end. I'm not sure. (laughs) Genuinely, he'll just be a pair of smoking shoes after the first quarter. Joel, last question for you. As a new American myself, I do want to ask you before we go, there is something happening in a few months that we've all been looking forward to. The Summer Olympics will be held in Paris. And on top of your Cameroonian roots... You became a French citizen in 2022. You became a US citizen later that same year. You could have represented any of those nations in the Olympics. France, so hungry for your services. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, even called you to try and talk you into Les Bleus' roster. You ultimately made the decision to join Team USA to represent the United States in Paris. Joel. I can't imagine what a tremendously emotional, difficult, singular choice that was. Can you tell us what ultimately made you to decide to play for the United States? Man, it was tough. Uh, the first choice was always Camus, and I'm from there. always wanted to represent, and I always represent anyways. And I just felt like, you know, growing up, we just talked about, you know, football all this time. Me watching the Olympics was like, it was just amazing. I was like, I never thought I would be part, I could have a chance to be part of it, but I was like, I want to do that. I want to be part of the Olympic experience. And to me, it's not just about like winning the goal. I just want to be part of the whole experience. And with Cameroon, that's the first choice. But then again, like it was not a guarantee that I could have that opportunity because for me, at the end of the day, that's my dream. I want to, you know, if I have an opportunity, I want to go for it. And that opportunity presented itself. And with Cameroon, it just wasn't, a, it's not a guarantee. So I was like, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. And it was a tough decision. Having my family, you know, in the U.S. and my son being American, that played a huge role into it. And then, you know, there's a lot going on you know, on the political side between France and Africa in general. And, you know, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page uh, because I just didn't want to uh, disrespect anybody. And when it came down to it, you know, I'm all about family. And my son being American was a big part of this decision. And then ultimately with my dream combined with, you know, what I represent and my family being in the U.S., he just made a lot, a lot more sense uh, to, you know, play for the U.S., which I'm extremely excited about. It, it is beautiful to listen to, and I think you sh- we should give this man all the federal donuts, America. Um, but, Joey, you mentioned your three-year-old son, Arthur. We have to ask, if he grows up to be a footballer, he could play for an astonishing four nations, Cameroon, France, the United States, or his mother's own Brazil. In your heart... When Arthur steps onto the field at a future World Cup, which team is he playing for? Man, um, well, first of all, I pray, I pray every day that he doesn't go past six feet <laughs> because the moment you go past six feet, it gets kind of harder to be, you know, a football player. Uh, so I'm not going to push anything on them. Uh, I've always said it. I keep him basketball. He can do whatever he wants. I don't care if he plays back. I don't care if he falls in love. But the only thing I probably push on him is him playing football. So he's definitely going to play football at some point. And if he falls in love, great. If he doesn't and he wants to do something else, that's on him. But, I mean, there's so much history in, you know, between all the countries. You got Cameroon, best nation in Africa forever always. Brazil, I mean, all the talent that has come out of Brazil, like that's that's amazing. I mean, France. United States World Cup winners 2026. Yeah, United States, 
France. Oh man, that's a that's a tough choice. I just love I just love that you will be the kind of parent where you'll be annoyed if he's doing his homework, and you'll be like, "When I come home, I want you outside in that field." Playing yeah, we got we gonna play we gonna play football. We're not, you know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a tough choice. Ultimately, he's gonna have to make that decision. But the one thing that I do is to make sure that he knows everything about his roots. Obviously. Me being from Cameroon, he's going to know everything about, you know, Cameroon and where I grew up. And now I grew up, his mom, uh, she, you know, my wife, she's going to do the same thing growing up in Brazil. Uh, so there's there's so much history. Uh, so he's going to have a, a tough decision to make. I hope he, I hope he's a football player, but, you know, if he's not, we're going we gonna to figure something else. Oh. Samuel Eto bedroom posters up now. <laughs> Joel Embiid to you, your family, your 76ers, and all of your football teams. Thank you. Mercy. Thank you. Appreciate you. Cheers.